This is the third programme of a series which looks at the railways of Great Britain and compares them as they are today, or now, with how they were at various times in the past, or then. Taken together, they provide a wide-ranging review of the changes between the age of steam and the modern railway. In this programme, we look at the various locations on the railways that made up the London, Midland and Scottish Railway, or LMS. As the largest railway company in the British Isles, the LMS served the heartlands of industry in the Midlands and the Black Country, the shipping of the Mersey and Manchester Ship Canal, the holiday resorts of the northwest coast, the beauty of North Wales and the splendour of Scotland. Our first scenes are on one of the earliest railways of all, situated on the northwest side of the Manchester Sprawl. On the 18th of April 1968, an LMS Stania 8F280 No. 48715 is seen at Atherton Vag Lane. This line was part of the Bolton and Lee Railway, which opened on the 1st of August 1828. This made it one of the oldest railways in the country, predating the Liverpool and Manchester by two years. The line was very early on taken over by the Grand Junction Railway, which in 1846 amalgamated with other railways to form the London and North Western Railway. This was to become the largest joint stock company in the world and was the largest constituent part of the LMS when that was formed in 1923. Passenger services over the Bolton and Lee Railway line ceased in 1954. The line was very steeply graded, including a thousand yard incline at one in 30. Some sections were even steeper due to mining subsidence in the area. Number 48715 was used for banking trains up to Checkerbent, as seen here. She was carrying an 8A shed plate, denoting Edge Hill Shed. Some enthusiast has obviously helped himself to her smoke box number plate. William Stanier's 8F280s were introduced in 1935 and they were the workhorses of the LMS. Their principal use was on heavy, long-distance freight workings, although they were used on passenger trains from time to time. At the onset of the Second World War, they were chosen as the standard design by the Ministry of Supply, and 240 were ordered. Others were built by various builders and railway works, such as the Southern at Eastleigh and the Great Western at Swindon. Many were sent abroad to places such as Turkey, Iran and Egypt. In Turkey they were known as Churchills and one has returned to this country from there. In September 1957, 666 were in stock, a beastly number to foretell the decline of steam. Your useful looking writer and friends are seen on the footplate of number 48715 as we charge at the steeply graded bank, looked after by the friendly crew. With regulator open and the roaring fire, the bank is soon conquered. It's time for a smoke and a cuppa before the engine is put into reverse for the return journey. Sir William Stanier, Fellow of the Royal Society, was Chief Mechanical Engineer of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway from 1932 to 1944. In many ways, the 8Fs were his most successful design alongside his even more numerous Class 5s. Today, the railway through Atherton Vag Lane and Checkerbent is no more. In Atherton, it's difficult to make out where the railway was until one reaches the remains of the old bridge. The brick-built parapets are obviously of railway origin. Where the actual tracks ran is far more difficult to establish. Modern factory developments were added after the railway closed, but even these have succumbed and are as redundant as the railway itself. Their existence was far shorter than the railways, and no doubt, in a further 30 years' time, there will be more evidence of the railway than of its modern successors. The course of the railway is still plainly seen, and its fierce gradient is obvious to the naked eye. Just to the north of Atherton, where the 8F once acted as banker, the railway crossed another line. 
This remains today, so Atherton still has a railway station, giving a service to Manchester, Bolton and Wigan. At Checkerment, the line of the railway has been severed by the M63 motorway, connecting Manchester to Preston and the north. Heavy freight traffic still travels over the Bolton and Lee, but at right angles to it, and not on railway wagons. Checkerbent sidings still show evidence of former railway activity, and a few buildings tell us that this area is indeed Checkerbent, once in the vanguard of railway development. Our next scenes show a 1960s curiosity. A Johnson designed 060 1F tank, number 41804, built in 1890, shunts the sidings at the Stanton and Staveley Ironworks on the 5th of July 1966. These engines owed their long life to an agreement made between the Ironworks and the Midland Railway in 1866 that Midland Railway locomotives would shunt at the Ironworks for a hundred years. Stanton and Staveley made sure that this agreement was kept to, as 41804 was withdrawn in December 1966. Another Midland locomotive, 1907 built Dealey 040 tank, number 41533, is also seen slipping and sliding across the road. 41533 was also withdrawn in December 1966. They remained together even after that, sharing the same fate, as they were cut up by Arnott Young of Parkgate and Rawmarsh in April 1967. Today, the Stanton and Staveley site at first glance appears to be a scrapyard. However, as the camera pulls out, we can see that it is still a very busy steelworks. The company's name can still just be discerned written in the old style in black paint on the end of one of the large buildings. This is where the Midland tanks shunted the yard and crossed the road until 1966. Now the area is covered in scrap steel, but a railway presence hangs on by a thread. There are a few wagon bodies amongst the wreckage. A Midland Railway Dealey Compound 440 sweeps past at Cheltenham Spa on a rail tour. This is Midland Railway number 1000, which was preserved in working order in the late 1950s. Here she's seen on the Midland Railway's main line to the West Country, from Birmingham to Bristol. A little further north on this main line is Ashchurch. Here in the sidings of Messrs Doughty's premises, LMS Stania Pacific No. 6201 Princess Elizabeth in immaculate LMS livery gives footplate rides up and down the line. She looks like a caged animal, but at this time British Railways had imposed a ban on steam locomotives operating on the main lines and enthusiasts thought that the future lay only in short demonstration lines such as this. 
The great preservation movement which exists today was born from the seed sown in places like this. Of course, since then, the locomotive has been given her freedom to run on the main line. Princess Elizabeth was built at Crewe in 1933 as the second engine of the 12-strong Princess class. These locomotives were the first Pacific design for the LMS. They were used on the principal expresses from Euston along the West Coast main line to Liverpool and Glasgow. We're now on the train at Ashchurch. It was a triple junction. A line to the left went to Malvern Wells to connect with the Great Western. To the right, a line went to Birmingham via Evesham. It's the latter that number 1000 takes in order to go via Evesham on its way to Derby Midland. The first railway to reach Derby was the line to Hampton in Arden on the London and Birmingham Railway on the 12th of August 1839. The line taken by the special avoided the famous Licky Incline. Other forms of transport are seen outside the imposing facade of Derby Midland Station, namely a trolley bus and diesel bus of Derby Corporation and a motorcycle and sidecar. Number 1000 passes through its birthplace, admired by several enthusiasts in their raincoats. Number 1000 was built at Derby in 1902 as number 2631. She was rebuilt and superheated in 1914, and it's in this condition that she is preserved as seen here. She was designed under the auspices of Samuel Waite Johnson, locomotive superintendent of the Midland Railway from 1873 to 1903. Today, she resides at the National Railway Museum at York. Not an orange jacket or anorak in sight. A queue of fans forms to board the footplate, and it's a tight squeeze to get off. Our final view on the Midland Main Line in the days of steam sees one of Sir William Stanier's versatile Class 8F 280s on a heavy freight at Normanton. This was at the northern end of the Midland system, which ran through to York as part of the railway empire built up in the mid-19th century by George Hudson, the Railway King. Returning to Doughty's yard at Ashchurch more than a quarter of a century on from when we saw Princess Elizabeth running up and down, we find almost everything changed. The rails have gone and industrial buildings dominate the scene. The only point of reference is the brick building which formed the backdrop to the LMS Pacific, which is now owned by the builders Messrs Bovis. The triple junction is no more, and Ashchurch no longer even boasted a station in 1996. However, plans were afoot for a revival, and a new station would soon be approved. During the nationalised British Railways era, services over the tracks of many of the original railway companies were fully integrated to allow through services. The original Midland Main Line became one of the principal spines of this network, serving as it did Bristol, Birmingham, Derby and Sheffield. Modern high-speed trains now dominate the Midland Main Line on cross-country services. Derby is one of the most important stations on the railway network, served by a number of different operators. This is another cross-country HST leaving the station for the southwest. With the privatisation of the railway network in the 1990s, this route became part of the cross-country franchise. It was expected this would be awarded to Richard Branson's Virgin Group. In addition to the cross-country services, trains to London St Pancras are operated by Intercity Midland Main Line. The franchise for this was awarded with the promise of a new series of high-speed diesel multiple units being ordered. In the meantime, the well-respected HSTs are also used on these services.
Regional trains are operated by Central Trains, who have a large fleet of two- and one-car Sprinter trains. Class 156 units are used on some of the long-distance services to places such as Norwich, Crewe and Skegness. South Wales and West Railway run services to Cardiff from Nottingham, reversing at Derby, using air-conditioned Class 158 Sprinters. The 158s were built at the carriage works at Derby, continuing a tradition from Midland Railway days when it was the company's headquarters, home of the enormous Derby locomotive works. Local services are operating using Class 150 Sprinters, the first of the modern generation trains. Local destinations served from Derby include Matlock and Sinfin. Moving on a little into rural Derbyshire, we enter the High Peak District. Across the tops of the mountains once ran one of Great Britain's most charismatic railways, the Cromford and High Peak Railway. Something of a legend in its own time, we visit it as it was about to be axed. Our record starts on the 30th of April 1967, three days after the official closure. Two J940607 saddle tanks, number 68006, and 68012 are seen above the dry limestone walls as they make their way up the gradient hauling an enthusiast special of brake vans. These locomotives had been introduced to the line in 1959 and had taken over from several vintage tank engines such as the well-known North London tanks. One of these latter, number 58850, is preserved on the Bluebell Railway. The line's LNWR heritage can be seen on the warning notice. Trains were slow due to the steep climbs and severe curves. The cameraman managed to film the locomotive several times as they approached Parsley Hay. The Cromford and High Peak Railway started at a junction with the Midland Railway main line from Derby to Manchester at Cromford. It ran across the desolate High Peak countryside to connect with the Buxton to Ashbourne line at the quaintly named Parsley Hay. It was opened in 1831 and leased to the London and North Western Railway 30 years later. To avoid tunnelling through the Derbyshire hills, the Cromford and High Peak went across them, resulting in very steep inclines. By the end, the railway was already partially closed. On August the 12th, 1963, the line down the 1 in 8 Middleton incline had been taken out of use and closed. Thereafter, trains had to run from Middleton to Parsley Hay. Part of the charm of the Cromford and High Peak was its unique track bed. Dry stone embankments were used instead of the usual earthworks. At Minninglow, the line crossed the best known and largest of the dry stone embankments. Together with other engineering works, this helped to keep the line level from the top of the Hopton incline to Parsley Hay, and thus suitable for adhesion working. Freight traffic on the railway consisted of limestone, coal, water and bricks. On this last day, the railway's reputation brought the photographers out in force, clogging the country lanes with their cars.
The J-94s were introduced in 1943 for the Ministry of Supply and were based on a standard industrial design by the Hunslet Engine Company of Leeds, which built many of them. They are sometimes referred to as the Hunslet Standard 18-inch. They were built economically but robustly for wartime service duties such as heavy shunting and became generally known as austerities. After the war in 1946, the London and North Eastern Railway purchased 75 of them and designated them Class J-94. These engines passed into the hands of British Railways and the two engines seen here are from that batch. Various other private locomotive builders supplied them to the War Department and by 1947, 377 had been built. 14 more were ordered by the Ministry of Supply and were built in 1952 and 53. 93 were built for various collieries, steelworks and docks. This made a grand total of 484 engines built over a period of 22 years. Hunslet built the last two in 1964 for the National Coal Board. The health and safety inspectors of today would have had a fit over the enthusiasts clambering all over the track and hanging out of the brake vans at Middleton Top. Number 68006 and 68012 are being watered ready for the attack on the 1 in 14 gradient ahead. Everybody strained to get a view as the engine struggled up the bank. Unfortunately, the engine stalled and had to run back to detach some brake vans. They then charged up again with half the load, returning to collect the rest of the Stevenson Locomotive Society's special. The two engines lasted only a short time after this. 68006 was cut up by Cashmores of Great Bridge in October 1967 and 68012 by Buttigieg's Newport in February 1968. You can still visit the Cromford and High Peak today, although it's now designated the High Peak Trail. The sign at Parsley Hay tells us what has happened to it, and it's pleasing to realise that this railway at least still has an important role to play, even if it will never see a train again. Bicycles, the best form of transport over the route today, can be hired at Parsley Hay. This is Fryden, source of much of the railway's traffic, especially in the latter years. The High Peak Trail runs alongside a number of sheds which still look as if they could be serviced by rail. At the southern end, the old rail loading platform can easily be discerned. The well-preserved stone embankment at Minninglow is another access point to the trail a car park being situated just to the west of the structure. This is ideal for those who want to visit the most remote section of the old railway, as from here to Longcliffe, it is well beyond the reach of the road. At Longcliffe, the railway track bed crosses the road on a spindly bridge. Here, there is one of the sharpest corners on the modern trail, once one of the sharpest curves in general use on a railway running line, as opposed to sidings which were often extremely sharp. It was this severe curvature that necessitated the use of very short wheel-based locomotives, such as the North London Tax, and ultimately the Austerities. The long cliff that gave this location its name forms the backdrop to a cyclist's progress. This was another of the railway's sources of traffic, as a small goods station existed here. There is still a small railway presence here, as a pair of oil tank bodies are used for fuel storage today.
some industry still exists at the top of the Hopton Incline, where we saw the austerities struggling in 1967. The trail crosses the road access here, and our camera is panning round to the east, where the level track started after the incline had been overcome. Cyclists are still warned about the severity of the incline. A gradient of 1 in 14 is still pretty hard work, even if you are as fit as this determined rider. 1 in 14 was the steepest adhesion-worked gradient anywhere on the British Railway system, and its severity can easily be seen in these views. Following the cyclist round, we see the remaining railway buildings at the top of Hopton, together with a permanent reminder of the old Cromford and High Peak Railway. The buildings include a cottage and the old permanent way hut. Sweeping across the high peak here is the full extent of the Hopton Incline, its path still remaining clear thanks to its new use. As the camera pans towards the top, we can see that there is still plenty of quarrying taking place although it's now 30 years or so since its output was last carried on steel rails. The Hopton Incline is unusual in being an earthwork. A little further to the east, near to Middleton Top, the familiar stone embankment makes a welcome return. Thanks to the fact that the track bed has become a hiker's trail, these spectacular constructions are maintained in first-class condition. Middleton Top is one of the principal attractions of the High Peak Trail today. The steep gradient was never worked by normal steam locomotives and wagons were hauled to the top by a stationary winding steam engine, housed in the building which still stands today at the top of the incline. The winding house has been duly preserved, together with the boiler house alongside, where the enormous boilers can still be seen. The methods by which the cables were attached to wagons and how they were drawn up the incline are well illustrated by the preserved cables, pulleys, track and wagon here. It's ironic that the wagon is a Midland Railway one, since the line was operated by their arch rivals, the LNWR. We move on further north to Rose Grove on the outskirts of Burnley, where steam was to see its final commercial use on British Railways in 1968. On the 18th of April 1968, one of Stania's Black 5460s, number 45444, rolls past Rose Grove Shed, in a surprisingly reasonable condition for such a late time in the life of steam locomotion. Another Black 545382 5, 2, is seen being turned on Rosegrove's turntable. Another of Stanier's 8F280s passes the shed light engine. The station, which remains today, is positioned behind the signal box and the angled road bridge in the background here. The line from Blackburn to Preston was to be the last to see steam locomotives working heavy freight trains. The 8Fs were amongst the final heavy freight locomotive classes to survive, some lasting to the very end. 
we now go to the principal attraction on this line, to Houghton Bank with its gradient of one in a hundred for the great locomotive chase. Thirty years ago, road traffic was fairly light. No road rage, traffic cones or gridlock. It was comparatively easy to film Stania 8F number 48393 in three separate locations. She was heading for the west riding with a load of coal empties. Under the fine three-arch bridge at the top of Houghton Bank comes 8F number 48476, ascending the bank with yet more empty coal wagons. This engine is a Stania Black 5460 number 45350, steaming under the same three-arched bridge at the top of Houghton Bank. Our last view here is of a grimy, unidentifiable 8F storming by with a loaded coal train on its way to Wired Dock. This traffic flow was the last on British Railways to be exclusively worked by steam locomotion. A train of empty coal wagons hauled by 8F number 48393 is seen further down the bank. The last train on Houghton Bank is hauled by another Stania 8F number 48451, also from Rosegrove Shed. Standard Class 9F 210 92054 crawls through Bamber Bridge. These adaptable and powerful steam engines were introduced in 1954 and eventually totaled 251 examples. The last built, number 92220, Evening Star, was the last steam locomotive built for British Railways. The 9Fs had scandalously short lives. 92054 was scrapped by Arnott Young at Parkgate and Rawmarsh in June 1968, two months after she was seen here. At Farrington Curve Junction, a Stania Black 5 is seen on a short freight, to be followed by two further Black 5s running to Lostock Hall Shed light engine. This junction connected the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway with the London and North Western. It also provided a route from Blackburn to Liverpool, avoiding the busy town of Preston. These complicated junctions ensured that crossing and adjoining traffic didn't affect through trains on the busy West Coast main line. An immaculate Pacific number 70013 Oliver Cromwell runs by light engine to work a special at Farrington Curve Junction. This engine was the last to be overhauled by British Railways and was to haul the very last steam passenger train of all, the famous 15 guinea special of the 11th of August 1968. The cleaners of Lostock Hall Shed have been partially successful in cleaning Stania 8F number 48476, which is coming off the line from Blackburn. Her Christmas present was to be cut up at wards of Sheffield in December 1968. Unusually spotless for the time, Stania Black 5, number 45156, Ayrshire Yeomanry, passes on the Lancastrian number 2 rail tour. She was one of only four named Black 5s. Another of the ubiquitous Black 5s, number 45025, is seen near Preston on the Belfast Boat Express. This engine survived the end of steam and is still alive today on the Strathspey Railway in Scotland. 45025 heads the Belfast Boat Express for the second consecutive day near Preston. 
This time, the weather was kinder. The line is the Lancaster and Preston Railway, which opened in 1840, becoming part of the LNWR in 1859. Returning to Rosegrove today is a depressing affair. The name of the road leading to the erstwhile shed is about all that remains, together with the gates that once led into the shed. If you look over the wall today, all you will see is this, the M65 motorway. When the shed closed, the site was earmarked for the new motorway, which was to be built between Blackburn and Cone. Uh, somewhat ironic in view of the fact that there was a perfectly viable mainline railway between those points. Sadly, the line, which used to go through to Skipton, was singled beyond the junction at Rose Grove and terminated at Cone. Today, the line runs alongside the motorway and the bridge has been modified to suit its revised role. Class 158 sprinters are used on Alpha Line trains through Burnley to Yorkshire via the copy pit route. But the only trains to call at Rosegrove now are the bus derived pacer units used on the Cone Line trains. Today, there are no freight trains on this part of the line at all, which is all the more remarkable when one considers that it was freight traffic that had meant that steam lingered on here to the bitter end. However, steam is still seen on the line, at least on Houghton Bank. This is Tor Valley climbing the bank from the Blackburn direction in the evening gloom. Steam specials from Carlisle via the Settle and Carlisle line use the Preston and Blackburn line on their way to Crewe or Preston itself. Another 158 passes under the three-arch bridge at the top of Houghton Bank, showing how much nature has repossessed of railway territory since steam finished. The local services are sometimes worked by Class 150 units. Even Stanier 8Fs appear still. At least one does. This is the preserved 48151, heading for Carlisle. By mid-1996, only one freight train ran per week. This Class 56 was heading to Blackburn to pick up a single wagon.
Houghton, now vanished, was the only intermediate station between Bamber Bridge to the outskirts of Blackburn. The 8F is only seen on passenger trains. It's quite a change of fortune for a line that once boasted heavy freight that it now sees two passenger trains an hour in each direction. This three-car 158 is halfway up Houghton Bank. Bamber Bridge still boasts a few sidings, but its importance has diminished since the time when 9Fs passed through. There was a junction behind the Pacer unit for the L and Y line to Preston Junction. The Pacers used on this line have various liveries. This one should be used on services within the Greater Manchester area. On the West Coast Main Line at Farrington Curve Junction, a Class 47 passes with a RES-operated special train. RES stands for Rail Express Systems and runs all parcels operations on the rail network. This includes post office mail trains, although the post office itself owns the new Class 325 postal units, one of which is seen here. Express services on the West Coast Main Line are in the hands of various electric locomotives, such as this Class 90. Most West Coast mainline trains operate on the push-pull principle, with a driving van at one end and a locomotive at the other. The forest of wires which covers Farrington Curve Junction today has little relevance to local trains which use sprinters and pacers. This one has a pair of Class 156 sprinters. This pacer is heading north on the local lines of the West Coast Main Line, whilst the next one is heading south prior to taking the diverging line on which we saw the Black Fives in 1968. Perhaps the most bizarre trains are the single car class 153 sprinters which are used on the line to Ormskirk. The track layout at Farrington has changed considerably since steam days, the Ormskirk line now having a single lead junction. This sprinter has come from Blackburn and it passes a northbound tanker train headed by a class 60 diesel.
Although the lines are wired, not all freight is handled by electric traction. An exception is Freightliner traffic in the hands of Freightliner-owned Class 86s. Steam has reappeared even here in recent times. This is Duchess of Hamilton heading south from Preston at the same spot as the Belfast Boat Express was seen nearly 30 years before. We go back more than 30 years now and further up the West Coast Main Line to what is probably its most famous part. An English electric Type 4 diesel, later to become Class 40, enters the Loon Gorge at Lowfell Station. We join the train to see why this line has always held such a fascination for passengers as the train threads the gorge. In steam days, locomotives would pick up water here from the Dillicar water troughs as the track alignment was level as it approached T-Bay. Looking back, we see how the railway fitted into the landscape and then passed through T-Bay station, at that time still a junction for the line to Kirby Stephen and Darlington via Stainmore. The train carries on through Greenholm and on up the climb to Shap Summit. In his cabin at Scout Green, the signalman follows the train's progress. This was an important intermediate signal box on the climb in the days before multiple aspect signaling, although it should be noted that many of the signals were already color light ones. The diesels seen here were the first tranche of post-steam motive power on the Shap line. At the time, steam and diesel types were working alongside one another, the diesels being used principally on passenger trains, whilst steam engines saw out their days on freight. Even passenger steam engines were used on freight trains at the end of their careers. This is an LMS Stania Jubilee of class 5XP, later 6P, a member of the numerically largest class of LMS Express passenger locomotives. It's seen on a train of fitted vans, probably carrying perishable goods. It has just passed through Tibet station and come to a stand in order to take on banking assistance in the form of an LMS Class 4 264 tank designed by Fairburn. These engines were the last pure LMS design, many lasting to the end of steam. The cameraman made a rather swift attempt to show the full length of the train. With an engine at each end, the train restarted, ready for the hard slog up to Shap Summit. The need to stop to pick up the banking engine had to be balanced against the possible benefit of taking a run at the bank but it was rare for steam freights not to take advantage of assistance. Most steam expresses would make as much steam as possible and get up to as high a speed as possible through the Loon Gorge. This freight, making good progress three quarters of the way up the climb at Shap Wells, is headed by a Black Five with another Fairbone banker.
another English electric type 4 passes with a passenger train and is followed by one of the post-war class 7P rebuilds of Fowler's celebrated class 5X Patriots, number 45526, named Morecambe and Haitian in 1937. These engines were often confused with the rebuilt Royal Scots, as they were fitted with the same boilers and the distinctive curved smoke deflectors and double chimneys of the Royal Scots. The 7P is followed by another of the Class 9F goods engines heading south on Dillicar troughs. Back on the climb, we see a light engine, Class 5, number 45160, a product of Messrs Armstrong, Whitworth & Co. of Glasgow in 1935. Fairbairn Class 4 tank number 42110 follows, returning bunker first down the gradient to Debay after banking another train up to the summit. Back in his cabin, the Scout Green signalman watches a returning banker. Scout Green was one of the favourite locations for railway enthusiasts and photographers in the 1960s. This is a Royal Scot. It's number 46162 Queen's Westminster Rifleman, and it's actually heading a passenger train. The Scot is followed by one of Ivat's ugly but efficient Class 4 Doodlebug 260 Moguls. The engine is working tender first on a train of engineers' wagons, which are probably to be used on the next weekend's ballasting work. The line nearer to the camera shows evidence of recent re-ballasting. We're still at Scout Green as another Class 6P Jubilee approaches up the grade. This is 45627, named Sierra Leone. The Jubilees were named after colonies and dependencies of the British Empire. It's sobering to think that there were enough of these in the 1930s to name 86 Jubilees. The assisting Fairburn tank bears no markings, so we can't identify it. Our last first-generation diesel is another EE Type 4. The later class numbers were much easier to say. One of these achieved notoriety in this year when it was held up in the great train robbery. Enjoying an easy climb of Shap is the third member of the first British Railway standard class of steam engines, number 70002, Geoffrey Chaucer. Having spent 12 years in East Anglia, as seen in volume 4 of this series, the engine was transferred to the West Coast Main Line at Carlisle, Kingmore in December 1963 and was withdrawn in January 1967. Another of the Armstrong Whitworth Black Fives of 1935 is seen restarting after being held at Scout Green. This isn't a serious problem as the train is a southbound one. It's therefore going downhill. The signalman puts the signals back to danger and we move forward to the last decade of the millennium. A Class 87 speeds up the climb as if it were not there, which is true for Scout Green Signal Cabin, as it no longer exists, nor does the little road it controlled. nor does peace and quiet reign between the trains, as the M6 motorway has been built through the fells. As a double-headed Class 86 Horde Freightliner travels south, we turn our attention to a Class 56 diesel under the wires, also southbound. Although the West Coast Main Line was electrified as far as Liverpool and Manchester in the 1960s, the northern part had to wait until the 1970s. But still, diesels run under the wires. The failure of successive governments to invest sufficiently in widespread electrification has undermined the economics. Only trunk halls are fully electric. Many trains remain with diesel power as they start or finish their journeys on those parts of the system which remain without power. These two views, one of an electric and one of a preserved Class 45 diesel, formerly a BR Sulzer Type 4 or Peak, show the Loon Gorge today. The peaceful coexistence of river and railway have been joined by the constant drone of traffic on the twin ribbons of tarmac that form the M6.
Turning full circle, we see the abandoned viaduct of the railway from Clapham Junction. No, not that Clapham Junction. This is the modern railway near Low Fell. Only the old railway cottages remain where the station once stood. A pair of Class 56s on a coal train are our last modern trains. But there's still steam to end our program. In 1995, steam returned to Shap. This was the groundbreaking run with a foreign engine, the 100th LNER Pacific, named after its designer, Sir Nigel Gresley. It's seen at Greenhall. but the best was saved to last. The National Railway Museum's famous Duchess of Hamilton, one of Sir William Stanier's finest creations, is seen at Shap Wells in foul weather. It brought a lump to the throat of many an onlooker, as we realized we could still enjoy the thrilling sight of a Duchess on Shap now. Don't forget, this is just one of a series of five programmes. Look out for the rest. Also, ask for other programmes from the Ian Allen SBS collection, including the five railway roundabouts, a four-volume history of Britain's railways, and a wallow through five decades of steam, from the 1920s to the 1960s. <laughs>